In this video, I'm talking with Dr. Jamie Merritt from the Institute of Creative Mindfulness. Jamie will explain dissociation and how to work with dissociation and EMDR. So if you're an EMDR therapist, take a look. All right. Dr. Jamie Merritt, welcome to the Art and Science of EMDR, and thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my great pleasure, Otem. So nice to finally meet you and be sitting here talking with you today. Great. So, Jamie, you're an EMDR therapist, a consultant, and trainer, and educator. You specialize in trauma treatment, and you're also an expressive artist, writer, yoga practitioner, performer, filmmaker, Reiki master, TEDx speaker, and recovery advocate. So I guess my first question is, what do you do on your free time? Practice yoga. I, 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 it's interesting because being an expressive artist, expressive arts therapist, that is enjoyable for me. Uh -huh. it, it's never like work. Right. So I love to be creating, whether I'm painting, whether I'm dancing, whether I'm making music. And because of my yoga practice, I do get a lot of rest and I do prioritize what is generally called self-care. Yes. I prefer to think of it more as self-nourishment. And I mean, as a result, I've created a life I really enjoy. So I'm able to hold space for a lot of these different things, which come together very naturally for me, which is this process of being able to create transformative experiences for people, which is just an outgrowth, outgrowth of having experienced the transformation of myself. Yeah. Well, you know, what I really like about your work is, you know, you combine things. So you combine two things like EMDR and, you know, yoga or, or trauma work and art. And I think that, um, the sum is bigger than the part. So you, you mix two things together and then you create something bigger, which is really great. Fusion, I like to call it. Yes. That's what we call it in dancing mindfulness practice, this art of fusion. Yeah. So, Jamie, what I wanted to talk to you about today is EMDR and dissociation, and especially when we're working virtually. Yes. Um, so I want to start with something positive and one of the articles that you wrote that I will link below, uh, this video, um, you said that this, the associative mind is one of the most beautiful constructs of creation. So I'm wondering if you're willing to explain that. And also I know that you have some, some of your own experience with dissociation, if you're willing to share that. Yes, I have what was called DDNOS, dissociative disorder not otherwise specified. So uh, my, my classification is, is probably right now generally described as dissociative disorder unspecified. Uh, so I have a part structure inside of me that's very similar to DID, but I'm just a few clinical symptoms short of having a full DID diagnosis. But mm -hmm. I do hang out with a lot of members of the DID community because my mind works in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I said that, that, that the dissociative mind really is, is such a beautiful aspect of creation is we tend to think of only the negative with dissociation. Because even in EMDR training among the EMDR therapists, there can be this panic that arises like, oh, you know, how do you work with dissociation? And the reality is, in my experience and what I've read into that so many of the gifted minds in every profession really are dissociative minds uh, because we have that capacity to see the world really through so many different angles mm -hmm. and our parts can inform a lot of that. Our ability to adapt can inform a lot of that. And I, I really love it when I'm able to empower therapists to see dissociation as not always a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, once a person with a dissociative disorder or a dissociative experience of life, as one of my friends likes to put it, once we can get a handle on the role dissociation has served for us, where it's been adaptive or it's been maladaptive, to use Francine Shapiro's wording, uh, in a state of healing, you can really learn to use your dissociative gifts very adaptively. And one of the ways I've done that, I believe, is I can just see things through so many different angles. And 
that is one of the reasons I feel dissociative minds are just incredibly beautiful and incredibly creative. Wow, that's a whole different perspective on dissociation. Thank you. That that's great. One of the things you mentioned in, in, in one of your articles about dissociation is how dissociation there there are different presentations of dissociation. So it's not it's either you have it or not. It's not all or nothing. There's 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 a continuum there. Mm -hmm. And to properly explain that, something I feel I have to get on the same page with to EMDR therapists is we all dissociate. It is a normal part of the human experience. And I think we can stop being afraid of it so much when we realize the places in our own life where and how and when we dissociate. Dissociate simply means to sever or to separate. It comes from a Latin root where we get the word dissociation. It means to sever or to separate. And so when you're really unpacking what does dissociation mean, the first question is, well, what is it that a person or their system is severing from? And it's typically the present moment because the present moment is unpleasant. It's painful. And so I know you and I are both mindfulness practitioners. Another way to think of dissociation is it's the opposite of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. If mindfulness is the practice of being in the present moment, continuing to return to the present moment when we sever, dissociation mm -hmm. is, oh, nope, I don't like this present moment. I need to leave it somehow. So think about all the ways you do that. You, you know, daydreaming is something I think we've all done in one degree or another. It's just that when young children who are in highly dysfunctional, trauma-heavy homes or systems or settings, yeah. daydreaming yeah. becomes a survival tool. And so like I look at my own experience and through a lot of my childhood, I would actually argue that my daydreaming was very adaptive because it kept me alive. Yet at a certain point when I was crossing into more of a chronological adult threshold, that daydreaming kept me out of touch with the reality of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's where it started to cause a lot of problems. Um, a lot of dissociative experiences that any of us can, can go through, I would argue are adaptive or maladaptive depending on the context. So for instance, if you binge watch shows on Netflix and it's getting in the way of your life and you're uh -huh. disconnected from the reality of your life and you're not going to work, you're not going to sleep, I would argue that's maladaptive. Yet for me in the evening, lying down to watch Netflix is an absolute vital part of how I allow my body to rest, connect with something entertaining. And I would argue that me doing more work at night would be dissociative. Whereas giving myself that space to disconnect in, an, in a very healthy way is, is very good for me overall. So dissociation is not black or white. It's not all or nothing. And I think to truly understand that with our clients, we as therapists first have to do this thing with ourself that I like to call the dissociative profile, which is look at where in your life do you disconnect? How do you do it? What triggers it? Mm -hmm. Is it adaptive? Is it maladaptive? Does it depend on the context? And what skills can you use to bring yourself back, so to speak, to more of a, of a present moment connection if, if you need to? Um, so, yeah, I just think there's, there's so many different ways we can look at it. And we have to start doing more of that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Because I, I think one of the things that um, we see in the MDR world is that therapists are you know, we're screening for the association, right? We use the DES and, and the mm -hmm. mid and we're, we're, um, we're scared. A lot of us are scared of dissociation. So I'm wondering if you can talk more about how to approach dissociation during an EMDR session. So let's say you're reprocessing, you're in the desensitization phase and a client starts dissociating. What do you do? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting question because even as you word it, when a client starts dissociating, my natural response as a consultant is I want to know more about that client. I want to know about their dissociative profile because just because they're dissociating does not mean you should stop everything down. As I wrote about in several of my pieces, many of us, especially who do have a dissociative disorder or are, are a little more intense on the dissociative spectrum, having a light degree of dissociation is not a bad thing. 
So I think we can we can train people and we'll hear the signs of dissociation when somebody stops making eye contact with you when it seems like they're there but not there. They're definitely dissociating. No, it's likely on a continuum somewhere. So if you start to see some of the first signs of dissociation, you may take a breath, check in, Rotem, what are you noticing now? Just uh, 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 saying the person's name could be a way that you check in and establish the grounding. I'm wondering if you might be able to make eye contact with me. Do you need to hold one of your grounding objects? So you can do little things to help check the grounding without breaking the flow of the processing so much. That's one thing. And the other thing is, newsflash, some of us can process in a light degree of dissociation. And in fact, that's the only way some of us can process mm. who, who have a dissociative disorder is if we we have just enough of that, it makes it more tolerable. So I, I'm a big fan of the affective window of tolerance model that the window varies size wise for different people. There's uh, up here on the more hyper aroused end. Right. It's the same questions you'd make with, with an ab reaction that some people can tolerate, you know, you going with that through an ab reaction because they're still in their affective window. And indeed that's really what you ought to do with most ab reactions. The only exception would be if a person is outside of that affective window and they're clearly hurting themselves, feeling too much feeling, and you may have to take an active role to reground them. And, and often I will use phrases like, are you okay to keep going with that mm -hmm. as opposed to go with that just as a check. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with dissociation. If you start to see some signs of dissociative <sighs> expressions, one of my first sayings is to always just make sure you've established ground. So saying the person's name, inviting them to check on one of their grounding anchors, and I could show the folks a, a skill that I like to use for establishing grounding anchors. That is often enough to keep the processing going. And then when a person's in that light degree of dissociation, um, you can do your, your secure checks, like are you okay to keep going with that? And if you're working in a part system, it could be that another part is knocking at the door. And that's what the dissociative response is about. So if you've laid the groundwork with the parts, a well-placed interweave, like could it be that 13 is trying to say something here? Mm -hmm. Often it enlightens the system just enough so that you're able to, to keep going with it in, in the light degree. So yeah, I don't want anybody listening to this to take it as, well, Jamie Merritt said you could keep processing with them when they're dissociating. It's, it's something you have to read contextually client to client. Uh, because even those of us who can process in a light degree of dissociation, of course it could get to a level where it's just not safe to keep going. Of course. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm the first to admit that. But what I get concerned about is when I see EMDR therapists wanting to shut everything down just because they see an itty little bit yeah. of yeah. dissociation. Because that means you're afraid of it and it ultimately communicates to the person in their system that you don't trust them. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the the grounding objects and I'm wondering if you can talk more about that and maybe even do a little uh demonstration of what yeah. basic grounding you know any kind of skills that um we can do we meaning in the therapist um when we're starting to notice right we're we're we're, we're always kind of yeah. balancing in the window of tolerance and we're if we're noticing that our client is kind of getting outside of the window of tolerance, um, what can we do to bring yep. the client back? So first things first, and I'll just give you a little tour here on my desk. So this is where I'm set up for telehealth, and I encourage anybody I work with online, whether they're clients or students, to have things around them that they find either comforting or anchoring. Like right now at the moment, my cat Misty is uh -huh. nurtured behind me, so she's one of my uh, safe and grounding objects. I have rocks, I have seeds, I have my mala beads. I have soft things like cush balls. I have Wonder Woman, who's one of my protector figures right here. I have a couple of boxes that I use as containers, uh, so similar to container skill. I usually always have a mug of something, like I have some coffee in here right now, and so taking a nice sip. Hmm. 
and really letting myself feel it can do it. I have some very nice things to smell if I need. I keep a blanket nearby me wow, if I need. you have a lot of things around I you. know. I have things that make sound. And so, I've again, more, more soft toys with cartoon people I like. Uh, so with, with sound like this, yes, I can make it for myself hmm. when I need. But when you have a chime like this, uh, so you can do it. Here are my two favorite things. A chime, and I'll encourage everybody to listen. The bowl is another beautiful one. Or Tingshaw's. And if you have a desk microphone like, like the one Rotem has, or I have one that's off screen, typically the sound comes through. And mm -hmm. when you're working with someone over telehealth, that can be a good way to signal their attention mm -hmm. if they're yeah. not responding to their name. Because one of my favorite strategies for making sure a person's connecting is to say, Rotem, what are you noticing now? Uh, but if a person is just not seeming to make an aware connection with you, a sound like this often does the trick. Just a real simple, I'm going to invite you to listen. So another skill I will do as part of preparation, because I, I believe in working with dissociation or any complex trauma, what you do in phase two preparation is your ounce of prevention that's worth a pound of cure. If you do your work well in preparation, these skills are there for you, for closure, obviously, but then if a person should abreact or if they should dissociate. So one thing I like my folks to do is uh, scan the place that they're in with their senses. So I might say, and I'm kind of rushing it here just because of the time, yeah. look around your room, notice what you see. Notice colors, notice shapes, notice textures. If you're one-on-one -on -one with a person, you could invite them to observe and describe what they're seeing. And then if you really want to create more connection over the screen, I might ask you, Rotem, observe and describe one thing you're seeing on my screen. Mm -hmm. And like on your screen, I'm seeing a chess set behind you. So if at any point I feel like I'm losing connection with you, I am going to look at that chess set. So is there one thing you're seeing on my screen, even if it's something that's on me or something that's behind me? I think I see a drum on your left. Yes. On the left of the picture, which, which is on your right. Yes, there is definitely a drum there. Yeah. So at any point, I might say to a client, Rotem, if you're feeling a little disconnected from me and my space, you can look, you have, you can look at that drum. Yeah. If that works for you. So after the visual connection, then I'll invite a person after I stop talking to listen for sound, either inside their space or outside their space. And I'll also say or absence of sound because some people do have hearing loss or they may experience sound more as vibration. And it could be that they just attune to the natural sounds in their space or if they have an instrument or something they can make sound with, they might deliberately make a sound, like even doing a gentle... Yeah. Like this can be a way to make a sound. Then we'll continue the scan with the senses. I'll say smell, either notice the natural smell in your space, or you can deliberately smell something that's nearby. Maybe take a sip of your beverage. And then for touch or texture, you can go to the objects. You can touch the clothes. Taking the pads of your fingers and touching the wall can be a way, or the table, mm -hmm. pressing your feet into the ground. So after we do the scan of the five major senses, then I'll ask the person, which two are the strongest for you mm, that's a good of idea. the five that's senses? Good. So I'll ask you, and it may differ day to day, but at least right now, which two are your strongest senses for really helping you connect to presence? Um, I really like the sound, and I, I found that very soothing. Um, I, I I would like that with eyes closed, which is mm -hmm. another question about dissociation mm -hmm. I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, and then that, that drum, I like that drum in, in the background, okay. so, so visual. 
Great. So you could use the drum for my space. Is there anything in your space that you could use as an anchor if you should feel a little here but not here? Yeah, I can use this. Um, oh, my book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You're too yeah, kind. Yeah, about mindfulness, um, uh, which is another topic, I guess, that I wanted to talk to you very briefly. Um, I, you mentioned here that we, you know, we need to practice mindfulness. It's not an option, which I... I'm a great believer in it's part of who we are and what we need to do and how we model, you know, we model mindfulness to our clients and, and we're, you know, if we're not present, they can't be present with us. You're exactly right. And you're not off topic because dissociation and mindfulness, they really are the yin and the yang. Like dissociation, as I said, is the opposite of mindfulness. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's just kind of knowing we can always kind of come back to the present moment, that it's yeah. a flow with each other. And so to be a good dissociation competent therapist, you have to have a, not only a whole battery of mindfulness skills, like we just reviewed with each other. Um, then just as to, to finish up this exercise, I always ask people, what are their two strongest anchors? Yeah. And it may be the same every session, or it could, if a person has a tendency for it to vary session to session, and sometimes that can happen if different parts are a little more active, I may just ask before we start reprocessing, what are your two strongest anchors today? And if it's something that's visual, we'll actually establish, I can invite you to look at the drum, I can invite you to look at the book, mm -hmm. if it's feeling like we need to, to check your ground. But to the point about we all need to practice mindfulness. I mean, a, a big thesis of that book you just held up is, yeah, mindfulness skills are great to show our clients, yet if we haven't first practiced them ourselves, it's likely going to fall flat, yes. what we show our clients. And I honestly believe that a mindful, present EMDR therapist, you are going to be most likely to keep the calming presence when things in your session make you go, what the heck just happened? <laughs> How do I handle this? Because uh, I really believe in that idea of neuroception, mirror neurons, whatever you're calling it, that if you freak out, the client's going to freak out. Right. If yeah. the client is start, I know that's such a highly clinical term, you know, if the client's starting to either abreact or, or dissociate, if you convey any kind of spirit of, uh-oh, what do I do now? or that's not supposed to happen, or you start to get nervous, they're going to pick up on it. Whereas you being able to breathe into, sink into the calmness in your nervous system will naturally help you handle and manage what's ever coming up in the EMDR session. And I have routinely seen through the years that therapists who have either their own mindfulness practice, their own embodied practice, their own consciousness practice of some form are able to do that more effectively and not be so afraid of these tricky situations. Absolutely. Do it more effectively and again, model to the clients either verbally or non-verbally, right? Exactly. Yeah. So um, that was really great, Jamie. And I have one more question for you. And, and the question is, how do EMDR therapists get better? How do we get better at what we do? Well, like with clients, I might say it depends. It, it depends on the individual EMDR therapist. I mean, I have my general best practices that I'll pass along for sure. Yet I do fundamentally believe different therapists have different learning needs. And some people do really well reading books and going to workshops and other people it's watching videos that really helps them. I mean, fundamentally you get better by EMDR by doing it. Yes. Uh, and I tell a lot of my basic trainees that no amount of lecturing, no amount of video watching or reading is going to help get you as good as actually getting in there and trying it. And I know a lot of new EMDR therapists struggle with, well, I don't want to do any harm because I don't fully know what I'm doing yet. And my answer to my trainees when they say that is one of two things. When you were a clinical intern, you probably didn't know what you were doing either. Mm-hmm. That they threw you into the process with supervision. So that speaks to the idea of getting a good consultant or supervisor, depending on what country you live in. They, they call it different things. Right. Uh, who you really connect with. Who is not going to make you feel ashamed for making mistakes. Because I tell my consultees that all the time. I'd rather you tell me your mistakes 
then feel like you have to be the star EMDR student when you come into the group. Yes. And yes. it breaks my heart when I hear stories of consultants who kind of create a climate like that. Like, no, I, I want to so find a consultant you can be human with when you're first learning. And the other thing I'll tell new trainees is in EMDR trainings, we practice with colleagues, right? I personally see no harm in continuing to practice with colleagues if you establish, hey, I'm not becoming your therapist. Uh-huh. We're, we're keeping that boundary nice and clear. Um, yet for trainees who of mine who are on the more scared end who just insist, I don't want to do this with a client until I feel stronger, get a colleague. Because, yes, a lot of EMDR learning is mastering the clunkiness of that original script. And once you can make it more internal, uh, you'll be able to do it more easily. So I think the key to becoming a good EMDR therapist is the more you practice it mm-hmm. and the more yeah. you practice under under solid guidance. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful to the first consultants I had in the process. I mean, I can still tell you exactly who they are and what they taught me and just how, how important it was. And it was important that I found consultants I connected with who understood me as a person. So I, and then how you learn, whether it's videos, books, conferences, that's on you. Yeah. Yet I yeah. think the key is you got to keep doing it and be guided by somebody who you really feel a connection with, who's going to help you through mistakes and not shame you for making them. Yeah, I think that that's a good approach. Um, thank you for saying that. Um, okay, Dr. Jamie Marich, thank you so much for your time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle to one thing because yeah. I think you went to ask me and we got cut off about opening the eyes or closing the eyes. Right, right. I, eyes open or closed. Um, I know there's a lot of, you know, it, it can be individual preference, but there's some mm-hmm. guidance with, you know, um, dissociation. So what, what are your thoughts about that? I think fundamentally it's client preference, of course. Um, whenever I teach any skill in phase two, I'm always very clear about you have an option to keep your eyes closed or open. You could experiment between the two. And I ask Phil more here and now while also helping you really kind of connect within. And some people can close the eyes, feel that sense of what we might call like dropping in the presence in yoga and still know they're here and now and in this office. Yeah. But for yeah. people who really struggle with flashing back, who struggle with dissociative responses, particularly during reprocessing, I think it's wisest to keep the eyes open unless they show you otherwise, that they're able to, to better handle it with eyes closed. Because the fundamental safeguard in EMDR therapy is this phrase, now, as you look back. And often that is right. my right. intervention with people, is now, as you look back. I just put a little more editorial emphasis on that now. And so if my eyes are open, you know, I could see your chest set. You could see my drum. There's, there's just a little bit of that extra safeguard that I'm still here in the now, mm-hmm. even though my mind may be taking me to these different places. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. Um, so again, Jamie Marich, thank you so much for your time. That was really, really helpful. I think that will be uh, very helpful for a lot of EMDR therapists, especially when you know it comes to dissociation and just demystifying you know, a lot of uh, fear. So thank you again. And I hope to talk to you soon. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.